Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us from near and far, especially those of you who have joined us from the USA and elsewhere around the globe. My name is Cedric Geffen, and I'm the president of March of the Living Australia. It is an immense pleasure to welcome you all today for what I'm sure will be an enormously heartwarming, inspiring, and memorable tribute, not only to a very special Holocaust survivor, but also to his saviors. Before we begin today's proceedings, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we work and live, on which this online event is being hosted today. We pay our respects to indigenous elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty of this country has never been ceded. Today's event is a follow-up to the fascinating Righteous Among the Nations online event we co-hosted with the Lamb Jewish Library of Australia in September, and we are excited to be once again with the LJLA to present Francis Prince in conversation with Professor Dr. Leon Kamides, survivor who was saved by the leadership of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church during the Shoah. I will now introduce an incredible and illustrious panel for today's event, Professor Kamides and Francis Prince. Francis is an educator with lifelong expertise in Jewish studies and leadership in Victoria's interfaith community. Francis's passion for Jewish education has led to significant voluntary endeavors, including co-founding Much of the Living Australia, serving on its board from inception in 2001 until 2009, and accompanying several of the student delegations on the journey throughout that period. Since 2014, she's been an executive member of the Jewish Community Council of Victoria, where she holds the multicultural and interfaith portfolio. In this capacity, she represents the Jewish community on the Jewish Christian Muslim Association board and serves as co-vice president of the Faith Communities Council of Victoria, of Victoria. Francis is also Vice President of the Australian Jewish Historical Society in Victoria and serves on the committee of the annual Lodge Ghetto Commemoration. Professor Dr. Leon Kamides was born in Poland and spent the war years under Russian, German, and once again, Russian occupation. He was fortunate that his father was able to have him hidden by Archbishop Sheptitsky he was repatriated to Poland in 1945 and immigrated to England in 46. Subsequently, he moved to the USA in 1949, where he received a BA in science from Yeshiva University in 1955, and at the same time completed a six-year course of study in Jewish studies and Hebrew literature and received a teacher's diploma. Dr. Kamides then went on to receive his MD degree in 1959 from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine trained in pediatrics at the University of Rochester and Boston Children's Hospital, and then served his military service as a Lieutenant Commander stationed in Columbus, Ohio. He was founding Chair of Pediatric Cardiology at Hartford Hospital for 30 years, and Chair of Pediatrics for 10 years, and Clinical Professor at the newly founded University of Connecticut School of Medicine. During this time, he also contributed to the medical literature, chaired a committee of the American Heart Association, which developed guidelines and educational programs in pediatric resuscitation and taught many students and residents. Dr. Kamides retired in 1997, so-called, in order to write several books, including Strangers in Many Lands and On the Edge of the Abyss, both of which deal with the Shoah. So without further ado, please increase the volume on your device to high, sit back and enjoy listening to our illustrious guests. Over to you, Francis. Thank you so much, um, Cedric. Um, good morning, everybody, near and far. Um, good morning specifically to people in Australia and good evening and Shavua Tov to those in the United States and hello and welcome to wherever else um, people might be. Way back in early September, the Lamb Jewish Library of Australia, together with March of the Living Australia, hosted an event where I was in conversation with Father Lawrence Cross from the Russian Catholic community at the Church of the Most Holy Trinity at St. Nicholas in the suburb of East St. Kilda, which is in the heart of Jewish Melbourne. I'm not sure if Father Lawrence is actually online or not, 
Um, but irrespective, I hope he's there. I'd like to welcome and thank um, Father Lawrence for really opening up and introducing us to this amazing episode in Jewish history. During that event, we explored, or more accurately began to explore, the extraordinary and little known role that two towering leaders of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, which is the church affiliated with Rome, not the Eastern Church, had in saving Jews during the Holocaust, during the Shoah. The venerable uh, Metropolitan Bishop Andrei Sheptitsky, who was head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, and his younger brother, the Abbot Clementi Sheptitsky, who both personally and via their leadership, and therefore included other monks and other people, hid, moved, disguised, maneuvered, did whatever it took to keep Jews away from the Nazis. The geographical region we are focusing on is near the city of what was called Lvov, which was then in Poland, and which is now is called Lviv, which is in the Ukraine. And those of us who carry Jewish history on our shoulders and our heads and hearts all the time, we go back to the 18, late 18th century, we're talking about Lemberg. Um, the Sheptitsky brothers, through their network of what was called the Studite, S-T-U-D-I-T-E, Order of Monasteries and other institutions, they ran monasteries as well as orphanages and other places. They organized at great risk to themselves, hiding places and escape routes for about 150 to 200 Jews, mainly children. Last time in part one, I guess, we showed a brief excerpt from a documentary where we heard from three people who as children were hidden and saved by the Sheptitsky brothers. They were Lily Polman, who then resided in England, Oded Amarant, who then resided in Israel, and Professor Dr. Leon Kamides, who resides in the United States. It is my honor on behalf of everybody here to welcome, warmly welcome, Professor Dr. Leon Kamides, the rabbi's son who was saved by the Sheptitsky brothers and went on to have an illustrious, I don't know, stellar medical career in pediatrics, specifically in the area of pediatric cardiology and resuscitation. And if we, do, we don't have to be, make a huge stretch to think about Leon's life being saved and then his own life's work in resuscitation and pediatric cardiology. If that isn't life-saving work, I'm not sure what is. Um, welcome to you, Leon. Thank you so much, Francis. Before we actually enter into our topic of the day, I'd actually like to hear about a little bit about you, Leon, the private person. Can I first ask you about, you know, your own family, your wife, your children, your, your in-laws, your grandchildren? Can we hear a little bit about your private self? Thank you. Well, uh, my wife, uh, his name is Jean, and uh, she is uh, born in the United States of many generations. Uh, we got married in 1961 uh, and uh, were fortunate enough to have uh, had three wonderful children. Um, our oldest son is uh, a teacher in a day school in New York, uh, and our uh, middle son is a cinematographer in Los Angeles uh, and um, twice an Emmy winner, I might add. And our daughter is uh, the head of uh, school nursing uh, for the city of Hartford and uh, very much involved with the COVID uh, issue. And um, uh, these three children have um, given us, blessed us with uh, seven wonderful uh, grandchildren. Uh, so we're very uh, thrilled with our family. <clears throat> Thank you. 
so much because as we go through, I think we all want to keep in our minds you as the private person and the family that has come from you, as well as obviously your professional achievements. Thank you. And I should also mention that my son-in-law is the rabbi of one of the uh, large synagogues in uh, West Hartford. <clears throat> okay. Um, my glasses are, are fogging up, but we better get on with our actually, with our topic. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me begin by asking you um, about additional information on the history of the Ukrainian Catholic Church and how that might be important for the direction that the Sheptitsky brothers then took during the Shoah. Well, what I'd like to do is to show you a PowerPoint presentation while I speak, um, in which will give you the background of the Uniate Church and then the Studites and then the Sheptitskys and then I'll tell you a little bit about my own experiences. So let me see whether I can do this properly. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, well, I'd like to first tell you a little bit about the Uniate um, uh, Church. And I don't know how many of you are aware, but from the 16th to almost the end of the 18th century, Poland was actually the largest country in Europe and its Eastern borders extended uh, almost to the city of Kiev, which today is the capital of Ukraine. And many uh, Polish noble families, uh, including the Szeptyski ancestors, uh, developed vast uh, holdings of land and built mansions uh, in these lands. And it's not surprising, therefore, that in this borderland between the Western uh, Roman Christian church and the Eastern Byzantine religious community uh, that the Ruthenians, as Ukrainians were called there, or some Ruthenians, uh, should have been influenced by the ruling uh, class. And this resulted in the so-called Treaty of Brest, which actually established the Uniate uh, Church, uh, which later was named the Greek Catholic Church by the Austrians when they ruled the area in the 19th uh, century. The Treaty of Brest was basically an agreement between the Vatican and this group of people who called themselves the Uniate Church, by which the uh, Uniate Church recognized the Pope as the head, their head also. And in turn, the Vatican allowed them to continue uh, with their established um, uh, traditions. Uh, traditions such as that the priests were allowed to marry and develop uh, families, that their prayers could be said in old church Slavonic, a language called Serkovnio, uh, and uh, other rites and traditions uh, that they uh, had. And <clears throat> this uh, continued primarily in eastern, in western Ukraine, uh, near the Polish border and within what was Poland and what is today Ukraine, until 1946, immediately after the war, when the Soviet Church outlawed, uh, the, the Soviet Union outlawed the church and transferred all of their properties to the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, many priests were arrested, including uh, Clemente uh, Szeptycki, who I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment, uh, and that was a very sad part in, in their lives. The church was basically underground or non-existent from 1946 until uh, 1990, when it was finally allowed uh, to uh, re-emerge uh, from the underground and their properties uh, were um, at this point returned. The current Archbishop of the Church is uh, Sviatoslav, Archbishop Sviatoslav Shevchuk, and uh, in case you're wondering, he's the one on the right. Um, so <clears throat> during the last session, uh, which I heard, um, we only mentioned Andre and we mentioned uh, Clemente, of course, but actually there were five uh, brothers uh, sons uh, of Sophia Fredro, and that's the mother, 
of these five sons, and Sophia was the uh, daughter uh, of uh, the famous Polish playwright, Count Alexandra Fredro. He was a noble, that's what he was called, Count Fredro, and Jan Kanti Szeptycki, who traced his uh, family back to the nobility and the borderlands. So there were, there were nobles on both uh, sides. So I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, here in this uh, photograph uh, is uh, Clementi, who we'll talk a little bit uh, uh, more about. Andre is uh, seated. He already had uh, severe arthritis uh, and eventually would end up, when I met him, he ended up in a, in a uh, wheelchair. Um, <clears throat> Stanislav, uh, who uh, was a landowner, uh, he took care of some of the lands that the Szeptyckis owned, and he was um, uh, killed by the Germans. Uh, Leon, uh, I'm sorry, this is Leon who was killed by the uh, Russians, uh, and this gentleman was in the army, was a general in the uh, Polish um, army. Now Clemente, uh, whom we see here as a, a church person, this picture is taken just before the Second World War, uh, started his career actually as a politician uh, and a, uh, a member of parliament. Uh, he was a lawyer. And as you can see from his dress, a bit of a dandy. Uh, anyway, he was part of the uh, Austrian upper house. Uh, and at the age of 47, uh, he decided to give all this up and join the church. As I mentioned, and I'll talk to about him a little bit more later, but as I mentioned, he uh, was arrested in 1946 uh, and unfortunately uh, died in the Gulag. And this actually is a very rare picture. This is a, uh, from the Encavo Day from the secret police uh, files uh, of uh, Szeptycki. Now, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Andrei Szeptycki. He was born in 1875. His name was Roman Alexander. He took the name Andrei when he uh, became a, a priest. He was the third uh, uh, son, uh, studied law, and uh, was awarded a doctorate in law. And immediately after he was awarded the doctorate, he decided that what he really wanted to do was to join the Ukrainian church. I might add much to the chagrin of his very nationalistic Polish parents. So not only did he leave Roman Catholicism, he left, uh, he left Polish nationalism, and uh, this uh, really was a, a problem, I think, for the family. He entered the Brazilian monastery in Dobreville, adopted the name of Andre, and then took his monastic vows and was ordained to the priesthood. He then was awarded a doctoral degree in theology from the University of Krakow, and he was installed as the Greek Catholic Archbishop of Lviv and the Metropolitan of Halych. And now Halych is the Ukrainian name for Galicia, basically. And the Metropolitan is that he has a whole area that he is the head of. And so he is basically the head of the church in uh, Galicia, and that was in 1900. And of course, as I will tell you, I met him in 1942. And this is a picture of him at his installation uh, in, um, in uh, uh, 1990. Now, <clears throat> in 1904, he reintroduced a very ancient order which had been established in Constantinople, the Studites. He introduced that, reintroduced that into Ukraine, and it concentrated on education for children and agriculture. And I'll go into that again, because that's what I was involved. I was a child, and we were involved with agriculture. And the main monastery uh, was in a very small town in the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains called Univ, uh, where I spent uh, two years, and I'll show you photographs uh, of that. As I said, in 1911, Clemente was 47 years of age when he gave up his career and entered monastic life. And then during World War I, immediately at the beginning, Russia invaded, 
The city was then, as Francis correctly mentioned, was called Lemberg under the Austrians. And they entered, they invaded uh, Lemberg and immediately arrested uh, Father Andre. And he was sent to prison and he spent uh, most of the war in prison being released in 1917 after the Russian revolution. And he returned uh, to what now was known as Lvov because it was a Russian city. Uh, Clemente was appointed the head of the monasteries in 1919, and this again will become important in a moment. Uh, Andre died on November 1st, and I remember that very, very well uh, when he died. A uh, very sad day for us. Um, and he was buried in a crypt at uh, the cathedral called Sviaty Yur in U Ukrainian, which translates to a St. George Cathedral. Uh, my wife and uh, my son and I visited uh, this area in 2007. Uh, I went to the cathedral and I went down into the crypts and uh, found his uh, grave and took a photograph uh, of it uh, at the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the cathedral. Clemente unfortunately died in prison and interestingly enough, he died in the prison called Vladimir, which some of you may recognize because it is the same prison and probably at the same time as Raoul Wallenberg was imprisoned in and died in. And it would be, have been interesting to hear conversations which uh, Clemente and Raoul perhaps had in that, uh, in that uh, gulag. Now it's interesting that Andrei Shaptitsky, who as you remember was born in 1865, at the age of 20 started to study Hebrew. And there is a letter um, in 1903, uh, which was signed by Sheptitsky. I don't know whether you can uh, see this here, but here's his name, Sheptitsky, Andrei Sheptitsky. And this letter simply is to a community of Zavalov who asked him for a donation of funds for a charitable cause and he apologizes that he can only give Asara Kronen, uh, 10 Kronens, because of his uh, extreme um, uh, need in other communities. I want to also show you here that he starts the letter, Be'ezrat Hashem, and he says, Achai, my brothers, uh, Shalom Aleichem, uh, how are you, hello? Ha'oskim b'tzorchei b'tzibur be'emunah who uh, engage themselves uh, in the needs of the community faithfully. And many of you will recognize this as coming from the morning prayer uh, from Shabbat morning. And this whole letter consists of a lot of uh, quotes. So he was literate uh, in uh, Hebrew. Not only was he literate in Hebrew, he went on pilgrimages to the Holy Land in 05 and 06. And throughout his time, he had very cordial relationships with rabbis. And uh, during the Second World War, very importantly, he had a very close relationship with Rabbi Yecheskel Levine. Uh, he donated money to Jewish charities. He donated each year flour from Hatzot on Pesach. In fact, he was accused by his co-religionists, by the Ukrainians, of being too close to the Jews. And he found it a need to uh, write a letter of explaining why he was doing that. Now, as you know, the Soviet Union uh, was attacked by Germany uh, in uh, June, on June 22nd, 1941, and entered uh, sometime after that into our area. On July 1st, 1941, uh, Sheptitsky, along with uh, others, uh, wrote a letter of welcome to the Germans. And I mention this because uh, this letter is being used against him. Uh, in the first paragraph, he says, we greet the, the victorious German army as our liberators from evil. We shall give proper obedience to the established authority. What is often omitted is that in the next paragraph, he states, from the government called to life by him, we expect wise and just leadership and administration that will take into account the needs of all the citizens inhabiting our country, irrespective of which religion, nationality, 
the social stratum they belonged to. Uh, he was a leader of a, of a uh, group. Uh, he saw that the Germans uh, had uh, obviously were stronger, that they were coming in and he didn't cause them to come in. Uh, and he felt he wanted to do this to get as good a deal as he could, but at the same time warning them that he, what was expected um, of them. In 19, February 1942, he wrote a letter of uh, uh, objection to Himmler for his action uh, against the population. Uh, this letter has never been found, uh, but a number of people, including Rabbi David Kahana, who was hidden in uh, Sheptitsky's uh, uh, palace, uh, uh, described it and read it, uh, but the letter itself was never been found. But in August of 1942, during that terrible August when there was a, a horrendous action against Jews of Lvov, during which 50 to 60,000 Jews uh, were murdered, uh, he wrote a letter to Pope Pius XII. Uh, that letter has been found in Sheptitsky's files, and last year it was found in uh, Pope Pius's uh, records before those records were again closed. And I want to quote to you because I don't think there is any other church leader who has written something like this to his Pope. Today, our whole country is in accord that the German regime is evil, almost diabolic, to a degree even higher than the Bolshevik regime. Since then, for at least a year, there is no day when the most horrible crimes, murders, thefts, and robberies confiscations and extortions are not committed. The Jews were the first victims. The number of Jews killed in our little country certainly exceeded 200,000. The authorities had in the beginning been ashamed of such inhuman acts of injustice and tried to make sure there were documents which could prove that the local inhabitants or militiamen were the perpetrators of these murders. Over time, they began killing Jews in the streets in full public view and shamelessly. So this is from the letter, it's a much longer letter, but I wanted you to uh, feel the uh, pain that he feels as he describes in this letter to Pope uh, Pius. Now, during that same August, when that action, in the middle of that action that was taking place in Lvov, he had a fatal, me an important meeting uh, for me and for my brother. And uh, this was a meeting of Sheptitsky with Rabbi David Kahana and with my father, Rabbi Kalman Hamidas. Now, uh, this, the purpose of this meeting, they were there as, as uh, representatives of the Judenrat. The Judenrat had discovered and placed together 600 uh, Torah scrolls and they came to Sheptitsky to find out whether Sheptitsky might be able to hide those uh, Torah scrolls. Sometime during this meeting, apparently, from what I'm told, the question turned out to the families. And at the end of the meeting, uh, the decision was made, an offer was made uh, to hide the families and to hide the children. At first, Andrei Sheptitsky was hesitant to hide boys because they could be so easily identified from the circumcision. But uh, after speaking uh, with his brother, uh, with uh, uh, Clemente, uh, they decided that they had to do it and would do it, and therefore made that uh, uh, offer. Now, my father was a realist. Uh, he faced things the way they were, and I have no doubt that in 1942, he was quite convinced that all of us uh, faced a um, uh, certain uh, death. I want to show you this and just read to you this little paragraph from something he wrote in April of 1933, which is barely four months uh, after Hitler took uh, 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 power in uh, next door in Germany. The words of these students, and he's talking now about the students who came to the rabbis in Bnei Brak to tell them about that it was time to say the Shema prayer. These, the words of these students resonate with us today and call on us to persevere in this terrible catastrophe 
that has struck our people and to preserve our hope and courage. A threatening reality has overtaken us and is demanding the greatest sacrifices from us. But Jewish martyrology must not weaken our resolve for self-preservation. For after this dark night, the dawn of freedom will shine at last. And in 1935, uh, barely a month after I was born, uh, he wrote something for uh, the Tisha B'Av. And the name of the essay that he wrote is called Jewish Children as Martyrs. He talks about other uh, tyrants who try to convert Jews and he says he no longer tries to convert them to his own faith. He wants to annihilate them. He shows no pity. Sympathy is a stranger to him. And because of this, Jewish children must once again become heroes. Teach them to bear humiliation with pride, to accept degradation and peace, and teach them in suffering never to deny in an assault from hostile forces, never to lose hope. Hope in the enlightenment of humanity, hope in the deliverance of the Jewish people. And this was published in August of 1935. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in the city of Katowice, which as you can see is right next to the German border. And in fact, until 1923, it was part of, um, of uh, Germany. I lived, we lived here in an apartment house, which actually was built by my great grandfather who came to Katowice in the 1860s. It's the apartment house on the right and we lived on next to the top floor. These are my parents. My mother was born in Germany and came to Katowice to marry my father, uh, who was appointed uh, as rabbi of this important community in 1926. This is a picture of my brother and me. I think I'm about three, maybe three and a half years old. So this probably was taken in 1938. Uh, my brother uh, Tzvi, uh, you might be interested, is a member of your community. He lives in Melbourne. He's retired uh, from the Faculty of Physics at the University of uh, Melbourne. He's unfortunately very busy uh, because he, um, uh, he cares for his ailing wife. And he's also busy because he's putting the finishing touches on what promises to be an extremely important book for understanding this era, uh, which is called A Very Narrow Bridge, and which is his uh, recollection, and he has an astounding memory uh, of events uh, which occurred uh, leading up to and including the Second World War. We had a, a nanny whose name was Agnes, and we also had a cook by the name of Anna. Uh, here I am in the pram. And Agnes and uh, Anna spoke to us in Polish, and our parents spoke to us in German, so we grew up uh, in a bilingual community. This is the synagogue, which was the very large and was uh, a part of the important uh, view of the city. And this was the inside of the uh, synagogue. As I mentioned, we were right on the border, so the Germans came in immediately after the beginning of the war. They filled this uh, beautiful synagogue with dynamite and blew it up on September the 4th. And this is a photograph of the, um, uh, of the synagogue after it was um, um, uh, blown up. Uh, very shortly before the beginning of the war, when, word, when it was rumored that war was starting, uh, we le left Katowice. My parents decided we should leave Katowice by train in the only direction open to us, which was eastward. And we were aiming to get, go to the city of Lvov because my father was born in a small town just south of Lvov. And we had many uh, family members uh, in that area, many cousins, aunts, uncles, etc., including my uh, grandparents. Unknown to us uh, in the meantime, uh, Germany and Russia had decided to divide Poland along approximately the line that you see here, and therefore we found ourselves 
uh, behind the Russian lines and under Russian occupation until uh, June of 1942. And these are my, uh, my grandparents, my grandmother, my grandfather, uh, my father, and uh, my brother. So after this meeting, this uh, fateful meeting on August the 14th, uh, which uh, we had, uh, which uh, 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 my father had uh, with Kahana and Shiptitsky, my father took two uh, rather dangerous journeys, uh, taking my brother first and then me, and we went uh, on a truck uh, filled with uh, workers who were going to Lvov to work and I was hidden among those uh, workers uh, to uh, uh, the St. George, uh, St. George Cathedral. And this is a picture I took of that cathedral in 2007. We entered the cathedral uh, after ringing the doorbell and really entered another world. Uh, first of all, there was a quiet world. People spoke in, in hushed voices. Uh, there were carpets on the floor to subdue any uh, foot uh, uh, sounds. Uh, there was a smell of age and a smell of incense. It was so different from the ghetto world uh, which we um, uh, came from, but also a strange world. This is a photograph of Andrei Shaptitsky, but I remember him better in a wheelchair because he was already um, uh, quite elderly and uh, uh, I was, uh, we were brought into his uh, study, into his library, he said something to me, which I do not remember, or maybe never understood, I'm not sure which. Um, and then I realized in that moment uh, that I was going to be uh, left there. Now, what you have to understand is that I was seven uh, years old and uh, I was immediately given a new name. My new name was Levko Khaminsky. I was told never to mention anything about the past never to mention any family member. Um, I was warned repeatedly about that. I would, they began teaching me Ukrainian, which I picked up fairly rapidly. And then I was also had to be taught how to cross myself and the very elementary prayers that a seven-year-old uh, would be expected um, uh, to know so that I could pass uh, for a Ukrainian. I was first taken to an orphanage in a, uh, a city called uh, Bruchovica, and my memories of Bruchovica are uh, very uh, bad. Uh, it was a mixture of extreme loneliness, a uh, feeling of being abandoned, and a constant gnawing of hunger. Uh, I was only there for a brief time, and one of the good things about it was that my brother was also there for that brief time, otherwise we were never kept together. And uh, sometime around in December, it was around Christmas time, um, I was uh, uh, taken by um, Marco Steck, who was one of the wonderful priests of the Stulad Order, uh, who took me uh, to uh, Univ. Now the monastery at Univ goes back to the 14th century. This is a picture I took in 2007. It's in the foothills of the Carpathian uh, Mountains. Uh, and as I mentioned, the uh, Studites were emphasized agriculture and it was a self-sufficient farming community. So we had uh, barns, we had the farm animals, the usual farm animals and the usual um, uh, growth of agriculture. Uh, that uh, was present on the farm. All of us had chores and uh, we uh, spread manure and on the fields uh, at the appropriate time to sheep to pasture, milk cows. And we also went to a village uh, school where we learned uh, some arithmetic and Ukrainian reading and uh, penmanship and so on. Um, this is the Tserkva, uh, this is the church. Uh, we prayed here only on Sunday. Every day we prayed uh, in our quarters in the uh, orphanage, uh, but this was a, a Sunday special uh, uh, prayer. And again, I took that in 2007. 1943, the war was beginning to turn the other way. The Russians were beginning to come 
westward. And somehow in this whole uh, uh, confusion, uh, somebody decided that all the children should have a photograph taken. Now, this was the day before iPhones, before people had cameras handy everywhere they went. Uh, so they had to hire a photographer, they had to spend money. There was a certain degree of effort that had to be taken in order to take this photograph of all the children in the orphanage. We were given new shirts and pants. We were not dressed like this. We were usually in rags. Uh, these were new shirts that we were given. And my feeling is that this picture was taken by somebody who wanted to prove that they saved Jews. With us is the uh, priest who took care of the orphanage, and that's uh, Daniel uh, Timchina. His name is, he was also a poet. Uh, and uh, here I am, uh, the arrow is pointing to me. You see a sullen face here, not very happy. And interestingly enough, the way they placed us, uh, they, there are three Jews here, this young man, this young man, and I and we were all placed together. Um, this is Oded Amarant, who uh, you heard made a, who is in Israel and uh, was an engineer. Um, this uh, young man, I knew him as Daniel Chervinsky, uh, but uh, his name is Adam Daniel Rothfeld. Uh, he, uh, unfortunately, his family was all killed. No one knew he was there. So after the war, he was left there. He was then repatriated to Poland. He uh, went to the University of Warsaw. He was in an orphanage, went to the University of Warsaw. Uh, make a long story short, he became head of an organization called CIPRI in Sweden, which is a disarmament um, organization for 10 years, and then became foreign minister of Poland. He lives in Warsaw, and about two years ago, we had a wonderful a reunion um, uh, with him, we are in close, um, uh, close touch. Uh, when I was there in 2007, uh, Father Benedict, who has a role in, in uh, UNIV now, uh, was uh, actually in the hospital. He insisted on signing himself out of the hospital because he wanted to accompany me uh, to UNIV and to personally show me uh, Univ. Uh, and we stood in front of the same church that we had stood before uh, together to have that uh, picture uh, taken. When uh, Daniel Adam Rothfeld became uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, he uh, and the, the monastery was given back to the church. Uh, he came here, he is with the church leaders uh, and established a plaque on the wall uh, thanking uh, uh, the two Sheptitsky brothers uh, for saving our lives. And also as foreign minister, he visited uh, the Vatican and met with the Polish Pope, uh, John Paul II, and sent me this lovely picture of himself with the Pope. He had told him that he told him about me and that the Pope sent uh, best uh, regards. Now, unknown to us, uh, our uh, the school we went to that I told you about, the teacher was Mr. Duke. And Mr. Duke on his own was hiding a mother and a child in the attic of our schoolhouse. This is a recent photograph of Mr. Duke's son, uh, who still lives there and is now an elderly gentleman himself. And he's showing off the Yad Vashem medal, which was given to his father. And that little boy who was hidden in, in, um, in the attic of Mr. Duke, uh, uh, his name uh, was Roald uh, Hoffman. Uh, he eventually came to the United States with his mother, became a um, uh, professor of uh, chemistry at Cornell University, uh, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1981. And as you can see in 2017, uh, the Ukraine were so proud of what they had saved and produced that they produced a stamp uh, in his um, uh, honor. While I was in the <clears throat> monastery, here's what happened to the Jews of uh, Lvov. In October 1941, there were 119,000 
Jews in the city of Lvov, about 30% of the total population. And this grew to 150,000 as refugees such as we came into the city. By November 1942, there were 29,000. By April 1943, there were 8,000. And by July 1944, there were 823. Uh, children were very rare because children were mouths to feed, but could not work and therefore almost always killed. And it's estimated now that among Polish Jewish children, the mortality rate was greater than 99.5%. Put it another way, less than half of 1% of Jewish children born in Poland before the war were alive at its end. To make it a little bit more closer to me, I published a book some years ago of my family's genealogy and my memoirs, and the front page has the names of all the people who I know definitely were victims of the Shoah that I mentioned in the book. This is in April 1945 after liberation. Uh, I was uh, in Lvov and this is in front of the opera house. Two Soviet soldiers came in to buy some cosmetics in a store that I was working in after school and they wanted to take me out uh, for a beer. So I had a beer, my first beer uh, that I ever had. And on the way back, they suggested we have three photographs taken so we each can have a memory of that day. And now you have a memory of it also. And I wanted finally to show you, uh, I was very extremely fortunate uh, because when I left the monastery, I was taken in by a wonderful woman by the name of Mrs. Tola Wasserman, uh, who had lost her entire family and who was uh, mainly responsible uh, for my sanity. I want to finish off by <clears throat> telling you that there were three Studite priests who have been recognized by Yad Vashem, Clemente Shepnitsky, Marko Stek, whom I mentioned, and Dan Daniel Timchina. There is one who has not been recognized, and that's Metropolitan Andrei Shepnitsky. Now, if Andrei could be here, if Metropolitan Andrei could be here, I know he would have a smile on his face and a smile of recognition. Because as a uh, powerful uh, leader, uh, he was used to being the center of controversy. Poles considered him a deserter because he left uh, Poland for Ukraine. Um, in the early years, Ukrainians considered him to be a Pole and criticized him for his Jewish sympathies. Russians considered him to be a Ukrainian nationalist conspiring with the Pope in the West. And the Russian Orthodox Church obviously had the same uh, feelings towards him. In fact, after 1946, uh, the Russian propaganda machine uh, 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 painted a picture of him as a collaborator. And that was such a powerful uh, picture that was painted that I'm afraid it even entered uh, into consideration by Yad Vashem. The things that are brought up against him, a letter of welcome to the Germans, which I've already dealt with. He is accused of uh, having been helpful in the formation of the so-called SS Galician, which was a division of Ukrainians fighting for the Germans in 1943. In fact, there's no evidence that he had anything to do with it, short of uh, 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 appointing chaplains for them, which he had to do as head of the uh, uh, church. I was told that there were greater expectations of a head of a church because he was head of a church. I'm not sure what greater expectations there were. In November, 1943, he put out a pastoral letter, you shall not kill, or perhaps better translated, you shall not murder. And it is claimed that this is a political statement and not specific about Jews. If you read it carefully, you'll find out that it cannot be a political statement, uh, but I'm going to um, stop now so that I can have a few minutes for your uh, uh, questions. Uh, so I'll uh, stop the screen sharing at this point. Thank you, uh, 
on behalf of all of us, Leon, for that uh, most professional, detailed and um, moving presentation. Um, I am mindful of the time. Um, there is so much to talk about further and so much to follow on because, you know, history always says it's not in the past, it's ongoing. It's unfinished business going on here with the, at least with Yad Vashem and the issue of, of honouring Andrei Sheptitsky. Um, um, I know that you've been part of this ongoing effort from, I believe there's been like 12 or 16 different applications. <coughs> um, I never brought this up when we did our first interview because I, I think we have to know a lot more about what happened before we can start talking about this sort of controversial issue. Um, would you like to comment more about those attempts? And then after that, just to let everyone know, then I'm going to pass on to Lauren Joffe, who is the director of the Lamb Jewish Library of Australia to give a formal thanks. But this question of what can be done, what is still happening, or is it a closed case? I don't believe that any case is closed. We wrote another petition, um, arguing for his inclusion uh, in, I think, June of uh, 20. Uh, we have not gotten a reply. One of the problems is that the um, proceedings of the committee are uh, secret, and therefore we don't honestly know what discussions went on. So you're fighting against windmills, basically. You, you hear a little bit here and there, and you try to answer that, but you don't really know uh, what's going on. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, history will determine this. Uh, there's no, uh, they don't argue with the fact that he saved Jews. There's no, it's not an issue of a question. It's a question of what was expected of him. Uh, at one point I was given, uh, I was sent a letter and uh, told as the head of, a, and, uh, of the church more was expected. And he gave me an example uh, of a, a, a priest in, in France. And I wrote him back and I said, what are you talking about? France is not Ukraine. He wasn't dealing with Frenchmen. He was dealing with Ukrainians. Uh, you can't use, you know, and I used the Rashi on the uh, Noah, as you know, is, is described as, uh, as righteous in his generations. And Rashi says, why does it say that? And I said, well, if he had lived in Abraham's generation, he might not have been called righteous. And it's the same thing. You can't put someone in another place. So I think we need to keep on trying. Uh, I hope historians will keep on trying. Uh, look, whether in the last analysis, whether he gets recognized by Yad Vashem is not terribly important to me. It's more to me a reflection on Yad Vashem than it is on Shetitsky. He did what he needed to do. He did the right thing. Uh, he showed who he was. Uh, and Yad Vashem needs to show who we are as a people. And so I'm interested in having them recognize Yad Vashem, not for Shabditsky's sake, but for Yad Vashem's sake. Thank you so much. What an apt place. <clears throat> and I'll turn over to Lauren. If you want to unmute yourself, please, Lauren, for our <clears throat> official thank you. But again, I want to thank you, I guess, personally and May you stay happy and healthy with your family. Admea Vestrim. Thank you Lauren. so much for your hospitality. Okay, thank you. Lauren, can you go on, please? Thank you. On behalf of the Lamb Library and March of the Living, I would like to thank Leon and Francis for a fascinating, informative, and comprehensive talk. When Ilana Lewin, our events, our volunteer events coordinator, noticed a plaque in Hebrew outside the church in St. Kilda, who would ever have imagined that it would lead us to discover the story of the Sheptitsky brothers. During our first talk, as Francis mentioned, we saw a clip of Leon talking about his experiences. And here we are today, so fortunate to hear you telling your story in person. Thank you for, for sharing your story in such a warm, detailed and interesting way. Thank you, Francis, for your in-depth research as always and your insightful questions. Cedric and March of the Living, 
Thank you for organizing today's event and for inviting the library to partner with you. I look forward to many more collaborations with you. And finally, a big thank you to all of you who have attended today's wonderful event. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye for now.